Yeah. Hey, Barbara. How are you? Good, and you? Good. Thank you. My pleasure.
So, how have you been? I've been well, thank you. you know, such a strange time <laughs> for all of us. Yes, for sure. Well, have, you, have you voted yet? Yes. Yes. I actually voted by mail, but I drove it, drove it in, drove the ballot to uh, NRG and turned it in there. Yeah, we were going to, and then we went in person on the third day and voted in person. Yeah, where did where did you vote? Well, we live out in Aleph. Oh, okay. So uh, we went to a, a small um, local library, mm -hmm. and it was an hour's wait, and they said, but there's another location that there's no waiting line. Oh, good. We went out there and we voted right away. That's great. I'm actually glad there are hours wait. <laughs> An hour isn't as much as there is in some other places. I know. I know. Actually, when I drove, I drove it, I guess it was about 10 days ago um, to, to NRG and there was no line at all. So. Great. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> but it has been interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It has not been dull. No, that's for sure. So, lots going on. So what's new with you? Nothing, I'm, you know, I'm back at Bristol Shalom part-time. And um, other than that, just kind of taking it easy. I do uh, cantorial soloist stuff at Emmanuel on, on Shabbat, mm -hmm. um, mostly on Saturday mornings. And um, other than that, you know, enjoying my grandchildren and uh, that's about and my kids and, and that's about it. Although they are starting school in person tomorrow. So that probably will change how I see them. So they're going to be going in person. Yeah. What schools do they go to? They go, they both go to Coulter. And then I have two grandchildren in Atlanta and they started back in person last week. So We'll keep our fingers crossed. Really? You know, I know the teachers are not happy. Um, no, and I wouldn't be if I were a teacher either. No, no. no. Especially the ones who, um, you know, there are some who have to teach their in-person kids and their virtual kids at the same time. Yeah, well, the teachers are doing double work. Yeah. Although at Coulter, they are not. They have which I think was pretty smart. They chose one teacher on each grade level to be the virtual teacher for that grade level. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you no, know, hopefully people will be smart and stay healthy and uh, we'll see how it goes. Well, I, th I don't know if you know or not, but both my wife and I are retired registered nurses. Ah, okay. So, so I'm glad that uh, we're both retired because I definitely. Oh, yeah. Yes, I give those people a lot of credit. Oh. And teachers too. I mean. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. So. It is not easy to teach um, virtually, or it's not teaching virtually. It's just teaching online. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So are you doing your stuff for the Herald? I, I'm assuming that from home. Yeah. yeah. Still writing for the Herald. And how's Gabby? She's good, thank you. So Celebration Company is opening up now two days a week. Okay. And so she because she's been really uh you know, with no day program for several months. Yeah, that's hard. So uh, now Celebration Company is starting two days a week instead of one. And her uh, provider, uh, which is a company called A Little Something Different, also has a day program that uh, she goes to once a week. So now she's getting out three times a week. Good. And that's good. She's, yeah, that's much better for her.
Am I frozen or are you? <sighs> no, you're frozen. There you are. You're oh, unfrozen now. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Does she have a roommate? Yeah. Um, we, we bought a house that we um, remodeled. Okay. So it was a four bedroom house and we remodeled two of the bedrooms. So it's a really huge bedroom and a huge bathroom. Mm -hmm. It's totally wheelchair, really wheelchair accessible. Nice. Not, not bullshit wheelchair accessible, yeah. <laughs> but really wheelchair accessible. Uh-huh. And um, she has two roommates in the other two bedrooms. Okay. And it's not that far from where we live. It's about a 12 minute drive. So oh, we good. get a chance to see her quite often. And we love the company that, uh, that uh, is her provider. Really good company. Right. That's nice. Yeah. So we used to be with um, Vital Living and Vital Living was a good company for many years. Then they went over to the dark side Okay. And uh, we changed companies and we're very happy again. Good. Good. Just like, you know, as long as she's being well taken care of and she's safe, that's great. Yeah. So that's, that's what's being done and that's what's going on. Good. And, uh, you know, we've been basically at home since... Uh, yeah. March. That gets very old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've been going into work, actually. Um, Melissa and I are usually there, but she's in her office and I'm in an outer office. So it's been, you know, it's been fine. We wear masks when we're near each other. And other, other than that, it's, uh, you know, Rabbi's been there a couple of days a week. Cantor's been there a couple of days a week. And, uh, so, so he went up to Colorado was last week or the week before. <laughs> he drove like on Tuesday, and then he came back on Friday. So, um, yeah. Yeah. What was that about? He needed a break. Hmm. <laughs> Hello. Hey, Gail. That is Gail. Hello. Yes. Hi. Hey, Gail. How you doing? Gail, unmute, unmute yourself. There you go. No, I had, you know what, I was on, I was in a class a little while ago and uh, I was using my headset, so I have to change the settings. Oh, okay. Well, we hear you now. Yeah. Well, it's a long time, Aaron. Yeah. Yeah, I have to have my people call your people. <laughs> <laughs> Do you still have people? <laughs> oh, I have to let them go. <laughs> this is my third class today. You've been busy. Yeah. yeah you, were, you were in Peter's class this morning? I was in Peter's class this morning. And then um, I have a Yiddish class at 2. Now this one. That's why you're gentle today. Oh God, I gotta change it. Yeah, you don't have to. It's okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Is that yeah, just no, he, uh, he said uh, let's see, I'm gonna rename myself. <laughs> um no, he said put your Yiddish name in. So yeah, this is an interesting guy. He was um this is the first class I um I was in uh, the class at Bridge alone, but now I'm in this one at the Workers Circle in New York. And uh, this guy is an actor, a composer, and a writer. And he was in um, uh, Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish. Oh, well. Wow. One of the actors. What's his name? Uh, Michal Yashinsky. Um, I went to see it. Uh, 
I went to see it last year in uh, New York. It was just phenomenal. I, I was, I, and I wanted to see it again, but I never got back to New York. It's, it's closed now. Mm. But it lasted a long time and they kept holding it over. It was, you know, it, it was the real fiddler on the roof and you thought that you were in your, your ancestor's hometown. Yeah. That's how realistic it was. Well, I hope we get a few more participants. Well, we've got four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> What have you been reading, Gail? Uh, almost solidly, uh, uh, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Atlantic, and such publications. Good. All political stuff. Yeah. I'm, I'm just too keyed up. Have you voted yet? Oh, yeah. I voted on Tuesday, first day. Did you? I, yeah, we voted the third day. I voted. Good. Oh, Sarah, I know you voted. Yes, I did. Hey, Al. Gail and I were at similar polls at different at the same time. Yeah. My sign is knocked down again, but nobody took it. Oh, maybe it's the wind. I don't know. Uh, my signs are fine. Yeah, somehow my uh, signs have been taken twice. <laughs> yeah, no, nobody touched my signs. My neighborhood is very um, democratic. Well, my neighbor has the same sign I have up, so. Erin, hello, it's good to see you. Hey, Suzanne, how are you doing? Okay, I saw you this morning too. Yeah, so you this morning, that's right. How many classes do you take today? This is like my fifth thing today and I have one oh more. Oh my God. Yeah, the women's club has something to, the, yeah, and CBS Women. It looks interesting. I wasn't gonna go, but it's on polling. It looks like it might be interesting. I'm gonna go. Yeah. Um. One of these I did outside, but it's I get the afternoon sun and it's too bright now. I'm just really glad that they got rid of the conflict because that was stupid. What did you say, Sarah? I'm oh. glad they took care of the conflict. I've had the video off. I'm finishing up a challah class I just took. Um, the, the conflict was really stupid to have. There's no reason that it should have lasted, but I'm glad it's fixed. Yeah. Yeah, it's either nothing or too many good things at the same time. I've been trying to get back on classes because I don't want to sit here for hours on, on end. So I was taking a lot of Melton classes online in various cities. Yes. Now, I am. even Jerusalem. And I'm not sure why I signed up for a class that starts at six, seven thirty in the morning. Uh, that's really insane. Yeah. <laughs> it was a momentary. No, it, it's, it's hope that I will learn how to go to sleep at a certain app at a reasonable hour, which is something I've never been able to do. So, ten o'clock. We'll ten o'clock. Oh gosh, I have a hard time be before midnight. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty fortunate. I, I, I sleep most nights. I don't have a problem sleeping. Uh, a lot of people, I don't know, just can't. I don't know what it is. Your brain just keeps going and going and you can't shut it down. Last I, night I fell asleep with eating my dinner, practically got my head in the plate. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I, I tend to get overactive. And so then I have adrenaline flowing to the point where the tireder I get, the more trouble I have sleeping. It doesn't make sense. Well, I woke up at two o'clock because I had stuff to finish for today. And I haven't been to sleep since then, so. 
Hi, Eric. He's oh, it's in the kitchen. Okay, we're going to give uh, people just another two two minutes to get here, okay? Okay. Hi, Alan. Hi. 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 Haven't I seen you sometime not that right that long ago? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> I've seen, seen you also and everybody else, too. <laughs> Peter did a really good job. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yes, he did. That was great. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a great class. It's things you don't ordinarily think about, but then when it's brought up, it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of those, yes. Mm -hmm. Interesting how much Yiddish is, has seemed to filter into English, too. Right. And I had a friend from Louisiana who's about as redneck as you can get. And, you know, she told me something about kibitzing. And I said, you know, I'm really sad that Wow, I that's quite a cup you have there. Yeah, right. When it's right in front of the camera, it's really something, right? <laughs> this, I'm not going to ask my, what's in there. Oh, that's that's my daughter's oh. blog. <laughs> Dr. Span, um, uh, uh, King Charles? Yes. Right. Yeah. Very good. Right. <laughs> this is his bark, his bark mitzvah picture. Uh, you know, when oh. I had my dog, he had a bark mitzvah at Bris Shalom, too. I have the picture. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was many years ago. I can't even remember when, but uh, Mark had his dog, and um, um, there were a lot of those dogs are not around anymore. But my dog's not around anymore. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, did he, and he didn't have a big party after that, did he? <laughs> he, he, she, 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 uh, she had a good time. I, she had a. Star of David that the rabbi gave out to all the dogs. Uh, it was, I was proud. Yeah, yeah we, <laughs> we did that at the uh, Congregation for Reformed Judaism on Bering Drive, not this year, of course, yeah. but last yeah. year. Right. Yeah, they had a little dance and everybody walked around and, and did Havan Nagila with their dog and it was cute. <laughs> Al, where's your wife? I haven't seen her today. Oh, she's busy. She's busy with election stuff. And she's she made a whole bunch of calls today, to try to get people to inform them about voting. So she's been really busy. Good, good. So she's taking a walk right now. She's trying to get a break. Yeah, okay, we're gonna start. If that's okay with everybody, sure. Let's go for it. <laughs> okay, so this is a two-part class, and uh, basically, part one this week. I'm gonna give you the background about uh, Rabbi Shimon Gershon Rosenberg, Rav Shagar, Shin Gimel Resh. That's where you get the Shagar from. And he's an Israeli who died in 2007. And his influence is now really on the upswing in Israel. He's an Orthodox rabbi and Orthodox theologian who uh, started uh, several yeshivot in Israel. And after I explain to you, that the, hopefully you'll understand why I find him very appealing, even though he's an Orthodox rabbi. And I wanna talk a little bit about postmodernism first. His, his one book that's been translated into English, it's a collection of his lectures and writings, is called Faith, Shattered and Restored, Judaism in the Postmodern Age. So let's talk a little bit about what is postmodernism. Okay, so generally speaking, postmodernism is a broad movement that developed in the mid to late 20th century across philosophy, the arts, architecture, criticism, and it marked a departure from modernism. Um, Barbara, can you put up the notes on the screen? Yeah, thank you. Okay, now is this, wait a second, is this this week's? No, no, it should be. 
this, this is next week's notes. Barbara? Find this week's, okay? Yeah, if you can find this week's notes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It may take a minute, Aaron, so go That's ahead. That's fine. No, no, no problem. Okay. So postmodernism is generally defined as an attitude of skepticism, irony, or rejection towards what is described as the grand narratives and ideologies associated with modernism and the ability to perceive the truth. It often criticizes enlightenment rationality and focuses on the role of ideology in maintaining political or economic power. Rav Shigar defines postmodernism in this way. At its roots is a loss of faith in grand narratives, in metaphysical goals, and in comprehensive theories. So first of all, when we talk about modernism, what was modernism a break with? Basically, a break with the church and traditional Judaism. That was modernism or it could be classified as a loss of faith in God. What is postmodernism? It's a loss of faith in man and man's submission to overarching ideologies, fascism, Nazism, communism, Maoism, and capitalism. So someone who believes in postmodernism essentially says, there is no such thing as truth. Now, according to Foucault, French philosopher, any presumption of truth is the mere expression of power. Another French postmodernist, Jacques Derrida, says language does not have the ability to represent reality and convey truth. Language is only a tool wielded by competing interested parties. Now, according to Zygmunt Bauman, Polish Jewish sociologist who rejected fascism, communism, and capitalism, in his seminal work, Liquid Modernity, wrote about materialism in the postmodern age. And he said, shopping and consumerism become ends in themselves. And the staggering, vari the staggering variety of options creates a yearning that can never be filled. Another expression of this consumerist drive, he said, is the inundation of media that erodes one ability to stand still within the tremendous flow of information and to process and digest that information. Okay, so no truth, no ideology, and a modernity which bases itself on consumerism, overwhelming consumerism and overwhelming media and the internet. Well, so what? We know that the, there's a limited influence of postmodernism in American culture. You don't see articles on postmodernism very much in the United States, do you? You don't hear about it very much. But postmodernism has a profound influence in Israel because Israel was built on one of the most successful Jewish grand narratives of the 20th century, Zionism. For decades, the story Israel told itself was one of pioneering, heroism, and faith, and the superiority of the Jewish states and the institutions of the Jewish state. Now, with the movement of the new historians in Israel, there was a challenge to secular Israelis. Perhaps Israel was not as righteous as it had been perceived or perceived itself during its century long conflict with the Palestinians. And the new historians in Israel shook the arguments about Zionism and led some to express the, their opinion that Israel had entered a period of post Zionism. And there was also a challenge to religious and Orthodox Israelis. That's more the original challenge of modernism. No God, no narrative, no meaning to life. 
the Jew and Israel respond? Well, it can reject postmodernism in toto as a heresy or try to come to terms with its perspective without sanctifying its perspective. Now, the Haredi society in Israel and in the United States also espouses cultural isolation. That's how ultra Orthodox Jews come to terms with modernism and postmodernism. They guard their educational autonomy and live as a walled community protected from the spirit of the age. Until recently, it seemed that wherever they lived, Haredi Jews were able to somehow separate themselves from the culture of the outside world. So for the overwhelming majority of Haredi individuals, they avoid watching television. They're likewise unacquainted with sports and other products of the modern world. Haredi Jews do not go to the movies and generally do not read secular newspapers. Yet this traditional wall was never free of cracks. No wall can entirely shut out the modern secular world. Totally. But it was good enough to keep out the cultural heroes of the wider world, like pop stars, movie stars, and even soccer stars. The Haredi public, at least in Israel, is not connected to mass media, the most powerful form of socialization in the modern age. And this disconnect protected them in large part from acquaintance with Western culture. Now I'm gonna digress for one second before I come back to my main argument. Rav Shigar's background is important because his parents were Holocaust survivors. He studied in religious Zionist schools in Israel and at the first yeshiva in Israel that combined Torah study with army service. While still a student, he was called to fight in the Yom Kippur War. His tank was hit by Syrian fire. Two members of his tank crew were killed and he was seriously injured. And he took with him this lesson that he's always kept and he said, faith can neither be simple nor absolutely certain. So as a person who established a yeshiva, actually established three yeshivot in Israel, we asked the basic question, are we still capable of faith in the modern era, in the postmodern era? Now, postmodernity perceives halacha, Jewish law, as expressing the eternal and the unchanging. Modernity saddles the individual with responsible responsibility for himself and his world. Moderns place the individual, not God, at the center. In merging God and modernity, you're attempting to unify opposites. Is this possible? Is this at all possible? Well, there have been three historic attempts in the Jewish world to merge modernity and halacha. One attempt is Torah im Derek Eretz, Torah with worldly involvement. That's of course, classically Rabbi Samson, Raphael Hirsch, sought to make the Jews citizens of two cultures. Okay, so who do we know in the United States basically says Jews can be citizens of two cultures? Mordecai Modern Orthodox. Okay, mainstream modern Orthodox says that you can be a citizen of the Jewish world and a citizen of the American world, both at the same time. Another attempt was to sanctify the material world. Rabbi Avraham Cook in Israel seeks to embrace the other by elevating and sanctifying him. Now there's a third, there's a third historic attempt called Masorteyut in Israel. 
Additionally, it's an intimacy and rootedness that comes out of being at home in Israel. Israel is the home of the Jewish people. We're at home in the home of the Jewish people. And we can anchor ourselves in that. And that's not only religious Zionists, but who is familiar with Franz Rosenzweig? Has anybody read Franz Rosenzweig's writings? Okay, Franz Rosenzweig came at the end of the 19th century in Germany. And modernism in Germany had rented the Jewish community. And what Franz Rosenzweig thought was that Jews full time no longer knew what it was to be Jewish. But basically, that they spent all of their time justifying themselves to Jews in Germany. It was a matter of identity, not of being home and being Jewish. Rosenzweig described this. He described a situation called being wholly Jewish. That is being ready to accept that everything that happens to one happens in a wholly Jewish way. Rosenzweig said all recipes, whether Zionist, Orthodox, or liberal, produce caricatures of men that become more ridiculous the more closely the recipes are followed. There is one recipe alone that can make a person Jewish. And hence, because he is a Jew and destined to a Jewish life, that is to be a full human being or to have no recipe. Our fathers had a beautiful word for it that says everything, confidence. Only the empty vessels in which something can happen may be kept in readiness, said Rosenzweig. So Rosenzweig talked about being wholly Jewish in a non-Jewish world. And that is no matter what happened to accept it in a Jewish way. In contemporary Jewish American society, Okay, this is me talking. This is what I feel has happened in contemporary Jewish American society. Judaism has become compartmentalized and removed from many aspects of daily life. For a growing number of Jewish Americans, Judaism has been removed from many of our aspects of life. The informal education once provided in the home and the neighborhood has been delegated to schools, synagogues, community centers, and summer camps. Formal Jewish education has a tendency to reinforce this compartmentalization, particularly among young Jews whose family do not celebrate the holidays, practice the traditions, or even share the beliefs learned about in religious school. This situation may be seen as a manifestation of larger trends of alienation, fragmentation, and the emergence of symbolic and optional ethno-religious identities in postmodern societies, in which ethnic communities and extended families have disintegrated and group identity has become a matter of individual choice rather than communal faith. Okay, so let me explain what I mean by this. First of all, what I see in a lot of Jewish education, whether in synagogue, especially as you move further in the liberal Jewish movements, is our Jewish education is identity, it's all about identity formation. And the kind of 
information we used to get in the homes and in the neighborhoods where we lived. An informal kind of Jewish education has been compartmentalized and left to the schools and the synagogue. Rev. Shigar talks about, it is an intimacy that places the book in the world of my ancestors, the world in which I often encounter myself. My approach is not nostalgic. It is as if my home were full of various objects. Among them, a gleaming state-of-the-art stereo system, but also an old tape recorder. Must one choose between them? I am aware of the differences between old and new, but I choose to hold on to both. So Rav Shagar asks the question, what does it mean to believe? Is it something, is it, is it a way to think about something? Is it, a way to, is it a way to feel something? Or is it a way to do something? So if I were to ask the people assembled here today, when you talk about what does it mean to believe, to be a Jewish believer, to believe in God, what does that mean to you? Does that mean to think about something in a certain way, to feel something, or to do something, or a combination of all three? Hmm. It's hard to answer, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> do you consider yourself a person who has faith? Okay, I will say that. Go ahead, Alan. I, I will say that I have faith not so much in God, but in the power of Judaism to bring us together in a way that's socially beneficial to all of us by observing the rituals and practices and so on as a community. That's, so that, that's about all I could say in that up to that point. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that faith is that important. Because, you know, I mean, even in the Thomas, it says it's more important how you behave rather than how you believe. So, for example, a Jew who visits the synagogue every day, who puts on to tefillin and recites the Shema, Rav Shagar regarded that person as a partner to belief, even if his mind is elsewhere while he prays. He says, faith is not a representation of the worshiper's belief. Faith resides in the situation, in the life of the commitment to the various mitzvot and customs. Intention is not so much a mental action that is, as it is an action's context. What do you think about that? It's not what we're usually taught, is it? No. We're usually taught that kavanah, intent, is more important than the act itself. It sounds a lot more Christian than what we're used to. Does it? No. Well, faith is a lot more Christian. Yeah, we, when we hear the term faith, we tend to think of it as a Christian concept, but it's, it's, it's a very Jewish concept, too. Yeah. Okay, but so. also, isn't Judaism all about action as well? Even, you know, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you do. Do what you're supposed to be doing. Is that the way you see it? I've read it before, yeah. I, I, yeah, I do th see it that way. It says that if you behave in a certain way, eventually you may come to believe, even if you didn't start that way. And I think it's more important how we relate to each other than what we believe. Mm -hmm. Well, a Chabad, a Chabad person would say that for sure. I, I think that uh, the, um, the phrase in the uh, Torah, Na'aseh Nishma. Uh, says, uh, do 
doing mm -hmm. action come before do. understanding or belief or um, nishma hearing. Uh, and and so yeah, repeating uh, repeating the the mitzvot over and over again will lead to um, becoming more uh, connected to the divine. Yes. Also, Rav Shagar would go one step further and say, doing the mitzvah and living a life according according to halacha would lend an order to reality to structure and to anchoring a Jew in the world. Because he talked about, and we'll get into this next week, that this structure relates to everything, including body language, movements, inflection, manner of speaking, all of which provide a context that incorporates the transcendent. You know, I don't think I've done a good enough job in, in preparing for this class. Let me, let me try to personalize what, I, what, I've, what I'm trying to say, okay? At this point in my life, one of the things that I realize is how, how much we, we Jews have really been shattered by modern movements. You know, I love Jewish history and I talk about Jewish history. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I realize is pre-modernism when Jews lived autonomously in their own communities. Yeah, we, we went from country to country. Yeah, we had no power. Yeah, we had everything from being expel, expelled from countries to the Crusades, to pogroms, to everything. But there was a sense of community that even among many Israelis has been lost in the modern age. When I read Rav Shagar, I suddenly realized that this feeling that I, he expressed this feeling that I had, that when you're totally in a community, when you were totally part of a community, that includes rituals, the manner of speaking, the celebrating time, who your neighbors are, that, that totally inclusive cocoon that wraps you in a community that even many Israelis don't have. Rav Shigar, talks about, and we'll talk about this next week. He talked about a new kind of Haredi Jew. He talked about Jews going back and cutting themselves off, not in the way the ultra-Orthodox cut themselves off, but in first wrapping yourself up in your own community so that you knew, you know who you are and can accept all that you are. And then instead of saying, what I am is the only right and proper way, everything else is worthless. 
talk about once you establish yourself and your community and understand who you are in totality, then you can turn around and accept every other community without saying they're inferior, my way is superior, it's my way or the highway. He talked about the problem with Haredi Judaism is that it becomes an orthodoxy in which that's the only way that you can become a Jew and be a Jew. But even though he was a very religious Jew, he said that that doesn't mean that other systems aren't valid and don't have truth to them and validity to them. And that's not what we hear among very many religious Jews. And that's what I've come to understand in reading Rav Shigar. Someone who says that you can be totally Jewish and yet live in the modern world and accept other religions, other philosophies as bearers of truth as well as ours. What do you think? It's certainly not the way we are generally taught. Exactly. Or what we generally uh, read and generally hear. Okay. I, my feelings towards it is World War II, 1945, changed our whole environment. The world was open to everyone and anything. After that, you could fly, you could move, you could be anywhere. Our children were exposed to other children that they had never seen, heard of, or known of in religion, in custom, in tradition. We had a new world. We moved away from the shtetl. We moved to suburbia. We moved away from our parents, our grandparents. We moved to other cities, other countries. The world opened up for us. And in that, we turned around and our children were sitting next to, my daughter sat next to the little boy who had um, this wrap on his head with a little knot on it. She was exposed for the first time in her life to another religion culture, ethnicity from far, far away. Yet he was here in America. She went to a middle school that was the United Nations of America. Our culture, our children were exposed to things that, and people and, and thoughts and concepts that we never even knew existed in our wrapped around Jewish environment and so the world opened up and they looked at it and we looked at it also and we started to interact with these parents because our children were there and so we walked with them we talked with them and we integrated with them and before you knew it our children were dating their children our children went to proms with children who came from the orient from asia from africa our children were in a new world and you couldn't be isolated and you couldn't be in a shtetl anymore and you couldn't have that mentality. And exactly. so here we are today, 2020, and we're totally assimilated. Exactly, except that this happened a hundred years earlier to the Jews of Germany. This didn't happen to us at the end of the Second World War. It happened to us in America, more or less at the end of the Second World War, but it happened to the Jews in Germany a hundred years earlier than that. Yeah, the, 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 during the Enlightenment. Wait, 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 one, one second. One second. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Gail. I'm sorry. This is what Zionism talked about. This is what Zionism was supposed to be an answer for. But what Rav Shigar is saying, 
in Israel in the last decade and a half, two decades, is that didn't solve the problem. Jews were no longer a minority. Jews were a majority in Israel. You had Jews living in a majority wow. Jewish country and Zionism and the modern Jewish state was supposed to solve this problem. So why didn't it? Because they were Germans first. Well, <laughs> they weren't Jewish. They were Germans. They were enculturated into their society. And that's what shocked them. They said, I am a German. And then I'm a Jew. We said in America, we are Jewish. And then we're an American. Okay, but what I'm talking really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what we're talking about is that didn't happen in Israel. And it wasn't supposed to happen in Israel. Well, okay, I think what happened, it started out uh, in one way, but then it becomes so Americanized, and now a lot of Israel, all these secular Israel, or everything except the Haredi, has all these modern Jewish values, I mean, American uh, values, rather, consumerism, the very kind of stuff you were just talking about. And I think that's what's torn it apart more than anything. That's part of it, yes. There's, there's something else too in that um, Israel, Israelis tend to be very secular because they don't have to seek community to, to be a Jewish. Whereas for us, we have to find a community. Otherwise, you know, we're no different than anybody else. We, we just sort of blend in. So it, it's, that's why we tend to affiliate more than they would. Okay, why are we uh, having this? Uh... Okay. So then did Zionism answer the problem of a Jew in modernity? That's the question. And does it, does it solve the modern, the, the problem of the Jew in America, are we bound to assimilate and disappear unless we move to Israel? Until uh, another type of hatred raises up that tends to keep us together when we don't have the option to assimilate. Is that the only thing that keeps Jews together? No, 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 no. There are a lot of positive, but that forces the issue. Yeah, it does force the issue for sure. I don't think that uh, Zionism solved the problem of modernity for Jews, but no. it provided another alternative to look at the world through a different view, the modern world. Does Jewish religion, does Judaism provide a challenge emotionally and intellectually? Does it provide enough of a challenge that one would want to live a Jewish life? Does it's it provide? Sort of a, but not for a lot. <clears throat> Why? Well, to live a totally Jewish life within the context of American society or American society as we knew up till March um, is difficult. You have to be willing to um, not do things and do things and be a bit different. Um, and not everybody wants to do that or can do it. I think the other the question is is should be the other way is can you live a Jewish life in Israel and not be at all observant or religious? They have. That's a good question, Alan. Okay. So what is a Jewish life? A Jewish life is not um 
uh, you know, stricture, Jewish stricture. A Jewish life is a lot of different things. And to, to the more secular Jews in Israel, they believe they're living a Jewish life. It's just not the life of the Haredim. It's, it means different things to them. Yeah, I think that you're right, Gail. Is that, is that, is that enough to keep Israel going in the next century? Is, there an, is that enough to keep Israel going, especially being located in the Middle East? But Judy, being Jewish is a lot more than being religious. It's, it's, we're a people. And so I don't think the religion, I, I don't think religion necessarily uh, keeps Judaism alive. I think it's a part of it, but there's a lot more to being Jewish than uh, being halachic. And if you try to explain this to many Americans who see it in the context of being a religion, like Protestantism or Catholicism is a religion, they find it impossible to understand what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they don't under, people don't understand uh, what a Jew is. Right. They only view us in terms of the Jewish religion. Exactly. And they don't understand that we're a people. Unfortunately, a lot of American Jews think of it as a religion and it's, it's not. Yeah. You know, isn't that what Kaplan say we were an ethical civilization? Mm -hmm. That was a nice way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully ethical. Yeah, if living right. Do you think more and more American Jews think of it as the same way their your Christian friends and neighbors do? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that makes it hard. Yeah. Because you know somebody can say like, "Well, so and so is Jewish, and this is the way they think about it." So why isn't it? Well, there's one more thing, one more la layer, and then we're going to stop because I'm going to go over, try to pull this stuff together better next week. Jews survived on one level, on many levels, because we had a grand narrative. Mm -hmm. We had a narrative of who we were, where we came from, and where we thought we were going. One of the things about modernity is people do not believe in grand narratives anymore. People are suspicious about grand narratives. And that's what Rav Shigar talked about. And, and that's what, that's the part that I have been consumed with in the last couple of months. And you know that grand narrative can smack of superiority. Yes. And he's, we're going to talk about that next week. Yes, mm -hmm. grand narratives can smack of orthodoxy, whatever that orthodoxy is. Yes. As we've seen in what in Paris this last uh, week. What, what is it? Well, as we saw in Paris this past week with the what young happened? man who decapitated his. I'm sorry? This young Chechen who decapitated a French teacher. Oh God, yeah, I heard that. For um, teaching his class, or bringing what the, the uh, young man thought were blasphemous right. pictures of Muhammad. You can't get, you can't get more, um, you can't get a better example of that than going out and beheading someone who doesn't agree with your orthodoxy. Oh my God. Aaron, talking about identification in the United States, we when I was growing up, we were taught that the US was a big melting pot. And yeah. I think for a while we became a chunky stew. I think oh. we're just a salad now where everybody does its own thing. Yeah, I think- Salad that, with bad dressing sometimes. Well, one thing is that I think that you can say that the narrative, if there was such a thing, the American narrative has been disrupted and maybe broken 
by by the pandemic. Uh, it was broken before then. That's for sure. Yeah. It just uh, it just makes well, it you, so much more obvious. Yeah. And I think things that were going to happen anyway in all apps, you know, walks of life have just been speeded up. We'll talk about that next week, okay, folks? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, right. Good to see well, you. And again, sometimes the presentation could be better, but this is what I've been thinking about this last well, couple hey, of months. It was a good discussion. You can tell. The presentation was a great discussion, so it's all right. Don't worry about it. I thought it was a good presentation. You can tell yeah. it's something yeah. that's really you, getting to you, and it makes you're sense. Just, you're used to following your outline and notes, which aren't here, so that doesn't help you. I'd love to get a copy of them. Yeah, me too. Okay, we'll do. I probably won't have the opportunity, but if you have readings you want to send to us to-, to uh, Yeah, I to would like- Trap us. As far as readings, the book Faith Shattered and Restored is available in English translation. Faith Shattered and Restored. And I'll talk more about the book again next week, okay? Thank you all for joining us. And Barbara, thank, thank you. you very, Barbara, thank you so much for your help. I, I wish I could have been more helpful, Aaron. <laughs> um, I, somehow I don't have those notes for today, so, but I do have them for next week. Okay, thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. See you all. Bye. Thank you for getting rid of the conflicts, Barbara. <laughs> I really appreciate that. My pleasure. It didn't make any sense to me either. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There are too Bye. many good Bye. things going on. See you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.